What's up guys, Dog Polk here and welcome back for another video and today we're going to be talking about a subject that has never been talked about before. Something that is going to break the entire internet. Something so revolutionary, a conversation that's never been had. I'm like the Christopher Columbus of online poker strategy here because we're going to be talking about GTO versus exploitative play. Yay! So I may have been a touch sarcastic there in the intro because this t subject gets talked about so much. In fact, this might be the most talked about online subject. Frankly, it's been talked about so much that it bores me even to do it again. It's always the same arguments. Some guy is like, well, in my home game, there's some nit that only has pocket kings when he raises. And then some other guy is like, right, but if you have a balanced range, you win anyway. And the other guy is like, kings you know pretty reasonable arguments there on both sides but for some reason this has turned into some massive argument about what should you do which one's better and all of this type of stuff and the answer is that you don't really have to choose you can use both a lot of people when they talk about how i view poker they say doug only does theory based stuff right he doesn't do any exploitative stuff and that's what you need to win and that just really couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, my career started very much just trying to exploit nits. Back in 2007, when I started playing poker, I eventually got into full ring, and I found out that you essentially did not need equity to try and steal the blinds if it folded to you. That's right, back in those days, if you min raised the button in full ring, the blinds would fold 60% of the time or so, and you would automatically make money with any two cards. It wasn't that hard to win. Armed with this valuable information, I decided to employ a large stable of full ring grinders where I basically taught them this. Here's how things work in the stable. If you get to the button, if it gets to your button, min raise all your hands. If it gets to your small blind, small blind min raise all your hands. Other than that, just play poker or some shit and it'll probably work out. And it did. It worked well. In fact, I'd like to think that back in those days, 2008, 2009, full ring st poker stars days, I single-handedly changed the meta because people started realizing People were just raising any two cards, so then they 3-bet wider, and they 4-bet wider, and it really did shift the game. I saw the stats change before my very eyes because of these strategies, and people that knew that my stables at their table could start making money by 3-betting them very wide, which was definitely a good strategy against people in my stable. As the secret got out and I had more people playing for me, the raises started to become less good. They were successful less often and more people were going after them. So essentially this exploitation got worse, right? But it was in games where the, the strategy was still very solid. And this is the thing, this is sort of like the core element of, of, of how we should approach poker. When you don't have good reliable data to interpret and create your strategy, you should err towards going with a solid theoretical approach. As that data becomes more reliable, you should move over toward doing a more exploitative strategy. I think where a lot of the disagreements are come from how quickly and how massively you should change. For example, some people like to make adjustments if they see one hand from someone to make huge sweeping exploitations all over the place based on one hand, whereas I don't do that. In fact, I don't really like making a lot of adjustments in live poker because the sample you get is so small that your data will never be extremely significant. Now, you might be able to make some small adjustments or maybe even some moderate ones because of things that you see, but you're never going to have a really large data set where you can start to make adjustments from. However, when you're playing a lot of online poker, you can make adjustments based on that data because you can see it and analyze it. And today, I wanted to walk you guys down memory lane with a few adjustments that I made when I was playing Heads Up back in the day, looking at my real sample of hands from Poker Stars in 2013 through 15 or so. Normally, these sections are a little more edited than this, but I wanted to get this in one go uh, and kind of talk about a bunch of things from my sample so they can get a feel for some of the adju adjustments that I was making when I played. Okay, so this is a graph of all by No Limit Play from, I believe, 2013, uh, or two, late 2012 to uh, late 2016, which should be basically the majority of my Poker Stars hands that I played. Uh, and this is only No Limit Hold'em and only on Poker Stars. So I played a lot of Full Tilt. I played a decent chunk of some of the other sites as well. But we're going to look specifically at this sample, and I think that'll be totally fine for the purposes of what we're trying to do here. So I decided to filter this down for just heads up. Um, and then also look at this in currency as well. Uh, but the, the point here is really not for me to show you the results necessarily, but I do want to look at the style that I played back in the day because I did play a much more uh, exploitative style 
back in 2012, 2013, and I learned a lot of very hard lessons trying to fix that. Why is this not working? Great. Okay. Perfect. So let's look at some of the old style that I played and you can get uh, an, an idea of just how exploitative I was going. And let's kick this off by looking at my Thubet range. You're gonna notice something rather interesting here. We've got a crap load of total air balls. That was basically my strategy. Essentially, going back to the full ring example, what I realized when I was playing heads up was a lot of people were folding the three bet way too much. If people are folding the three bet way too much, why would I want to three bet stronger hands when I can just bluff with these very garbagey bottom of my range hands and simply make money? And so there were plenty of people where I would three bet 25, 27% of my hands and it would mainly be air. In fact, if we look at some of the calls, let me just filter for call here, call people up to bet. Oh wait, I just do it like this. Preflop, call to bet. If we look at some of the calls, we can see hands as strong as sometimes ace, jack, and king, queen working their way into the call range, despite having uh, absolute boatloads of bluffs pre. So, the result was three bet range ended up looking very polarized like this. Now. Poker has evolved from those days. Back then, people would open too wide and play too tight against raise. So an exploitation that I made based on the data from my sample was, and I had a lot of spreadsheets and stuff uh, that I used to calculate this stuff. In fact, in my heads up uh, ma ma masterclass, there's been enough masterclasses lately. In my heads up course that I put up a couple years ago, I put the spreadsheet in there and talk and explain this more in depth. Um, but basically, I calculated out the amount of equity that I needed to make these bluffs, and it was a very low threshold. The lower the threshold that I needed was, the more I would use total air balls, the less I would use my value range, and the more I would do about overall. These are overall adjustments that I would make for my data sets. Now, I had my overall idea for what I thought I should be doing um, with no info. Then I had my overall idea for what I should be doing given the player pool. And then uh, as I had more information on specific opponents, I had my strategies versus them. And basically, as you play people a lot, you play them many times, uh, you can start to get a much, more, um, a much more direct idea of the strategies that they're employing, and you can begin to build counter strategies that are particularly good against them and not just the player pool itself. So obviously, this is very exploitative. Let's take a look by position and see what I was doing. So in the small blind, I was opening 92% of hands. That's too many. You should probably be aiming for like 80, 85, maybe high 80s on average. But this is simply because people were folding way too much. If you look here, I successfully stole 30% of hands. I guarantee you there's a bunch of like 2.1 Xing, very small raises in here. Simply, this was working way too much. And I was three bang 23%. Again, not a number you realistically can probably get away with. I think this should probably be closer to 18 to 20%. Um, this is a little bit high and obviously way too bluff heavy. If you're playing somebody and they're doing this, what I did right here, just stop raising wide and don't fold to their three bets very much. And they're going to get owned. They have six, five offsuit a lot. Looking at some of my other stats, my raise by street was very low. It was six, six, nine. Um, actually, it's going to get lower. I went through a style uh, in 2014, 2015, where I wasn't raising flops or turns much at all, especially flops. I tend to play most of my range on the check call. Uh, but you can see that uh, stylistically, this is going to change over time. My flop bet by street, 50, 57, 63, uh, trying to polarize range on the flop and barrel off. This is out of style nowadays because I guess like, you know, poker changes a lot in six years. Um, but anyway, my one one soft flop very high, even though I had very wide ranges. So what's the result here? I'm playing way more hands than my opponent. I'm bluffing them way more pre-flop. And then post-flop, I'm really gunning them down and winning more pots than them. The result is going to be that you win way too many pots. In fact, my one hand percentage here is 55% of hands. Do you want to know what winning 55% of hands looks like? It looks like this. Anyway, coming back to this, let's see the difference between this sample and how my play evolved in late 2013 into 2014 and on. As you can see, uh, the button open dropped substantially. Three about seemed fairly similar, although I, I played a little bit tighter in the big blind. Um, there is some limping going on here, apparently, which is weird. Why is there so much limping? We'll never know. Why is there so much limping? Uh, 
Ah. Some 2-5. Must have been experimenting with some strategies. Based on this graph, looks like it uh, went well. Anyway, coming back and looking at uh, the, the hands after that, uh, you can see that the style, my style changed uh, quite a bit. Uh, I was three, bit, I was playing a bit tighter in the big blind. I was raising much tighter. There were some limping hands. I experimented with a bit in this sample as well. Um, my turn raise went down a bit. My one went soft flop and the big blind dropped a little bit as well. And then if we look at the overall three bet frequency and like the hands I'm using, you can see that this substantially changed. I still had some bluffs and I still kicked, it, kicked those in from time to time, but um, it moved from being so polar over to being more value based. And by the end of it, it was much, much, much less of these hands because I simply couldn't make them profitable versus a majority of my opponents. It's also important to note that a chunk of this is played uh, streaming at small stakes. So I imagine that those are substantially impacting uh, some win rate and um, values, but you know, what are you gonna do? Anyway, going back to the overall sample here, um, looking at it by stakes, mainly was playing NL 10K and 5K with this, with a chunk of, oh, I played some, there's some cap in here. Shit, I forgot to filter out the cap. Luckily I hadn't played too much cap, but I did change my, my stats here slightly. So it's worth noting that that, that uh, did affect something here. Anyway, point remains. What were some exploitative stuff that I did? And I remember very specifically a session against Jungle where I got absolutely owned and learned a very, very valuable lesson about trying to exploitively over bluff people because they don't have to fold. They simply don't have to. And if you look by at, at Jungle's fold by street uh, in three bet pot, he folded 41% of my flop bet. Six, oh sorry. 39% of my flop bet, 30 to my turn bet, and 41 to my river bet. So very low numbers here. Also keep in mind that when I'm bluffing, this number will be a lot lower because of card removal. And there was one specific call that I remember, I, that I remember to this day, and I think I've talked about this somewhere else. I forgot, I've done a lot of content by now, but I do want to bring it up because it, it, it highlighted a moment where I really realized I was gonna have to do something differently. And it's this pot. Okay, this is where this 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 is where this video is culminating. This is where we're headed, guys. All right. So, jungle opens. I think about him with the nothing. Jungle calls. Gutter got some equity. Go ahead and bet this. He calls. Turns a king of spades. Bet it again. He calls. River. So in this spot, it feels like I have a good bluffing hand because I have a missed straw. Maybe he has a missed straight draw or flush draw, and I can have a bunch of hands for value. But how many hands can I have for value? And then also consider how bad the eight of clubs is here. He now can't have eight X of clubs for a missed flush draw. He's now as likely to have nine eight. And then also think about, think about my three bet range. Think about all of those five, four offsuits, eight, five offsuits, five, three offsuits. You know, yeah, there's some seven, six in there too, but think about all of the hands I can have for that missed. And I jammed the river and jungle calls and he had the queen high. And I think I have to talk about this hand somewhere, but jungle realized that my strategy was three about a ton of bluffs and barrel people down in the streets. And if they know that's what you're doing, then they can counter you by doing stuff like this. And this is where the exploitative battle starts to begin. And this is why I think uh, when I look back at my results, the person I lost the most buy-ins to was Jungle. And it was mainly because the way that I tried to play heads up was to be an absolutely crazy, insane asshole running people down all over the place. And then you run into people that read your hands well and are like, you know what? I'm just gonna call you out with Queen High because I don't think you got it. And then you're gonna run into some trouble. I vividly remember talking to Fees about this hand afterwards and Fees being like, yeah, you, you way over bluff here. So obviously you can just call you down with whatever. I thought about it and I was like, you're definitely right. And that's when I started to evolve my play. That's when I started to think about when should I go for buffs like that? Um, you know, when do I need to reel it in? How do I want to construct my strategy? And that process happens in so many spots in so many times over the course of your career that you're always learning. And that's really your goal. Your goal is to always be trying to learn how is my strategy exploitable? That one's a very simple one. But I'll tell you what, in the future, I was much more aware of my triple barrel bluffs. This happens with check raises. This happens with, with anything else that you're creating. This happens when people start to four bet you a lot. This happens, there are so many different ways that this happens. Um, and then, you know, really, you wanna be playing people that you can exploit well that aren't willing to exploit you. An example of this is Lohasa, who always played the same strategy against me. Well, 
He would vary it a little bit, and apparently I don't have most of the hands in here. Because we played a lot more than this. I guess we played a lot in full tilt. Um, why is this so few hands? Something's up. This can't be all of them. Anyway, Wilhasa beat me in red line. But I beat him in green line because he was doing crazy shit. And we think about that hand with me in jungle. If I'm doing stuff like that all the time, my red line is going to go up a lot because there is no opportunity for me to fold anywhere if I'm just 3 betting nothing and barreling it off when I have nothing. Right? It's going to be up to him. I'm either winning red line or losing blue line. It's a trade-off. So there's always this balance you have to try and strike. Good players strike a good balance of that. Weak ones, not so much. But if we look at Will Haas's one hand percentage, it's only 46. So uh, even though he was winning in red line, he was doing a lot of spewy stuff in big spots and losing a lot of small pots they shouldn't be. For example, his big line defend was 65 and he was 3 betting 29. This is not really a very standard style. At least it wasn't in my day. I'm not up to date on what's the newest, latest, and greatest. So with this style, you're playing too tight, you're doing too much. So raising small is a very good strategy. With these exact stats, I don't know what the upgrade need to open is, but the point is I would base it around these types of factors. Also, the guy see bet way too much and then typically barreled later streets less, which apparently was actually correct the whole time. Who knew? He would never fold the turn to a bet, so you had to bomb it on the turn, and then you get to the river with way too much goddamn air. And I'm telling you right now, I guess this isn't the sample I know what it is. Like, I don't know what hands are in the sample, because we played like 20, 25, 30,000 hands. This doesn't seem like enough hands. Um, but I guarantee you, I guarantee you some of these river folds. Only four of them. Okay, well, let's take a look. All right, we're going for the thin value bet. Actually, not that thin. Three bet, six, seven suited. They call king, king five, bet call. Gem, fold. I like this. Obviously, I have all, all of the, like, the high pairs. You can't really have many of those. Doesn't have quads very often. That's gonna be for value. We're looking at a small sample here, so. Yeah, these are value, okay. Anyway, the point is, when people play uh, styles like this, you're going to find a lot of bluffs in these ranges. And if we look back at the way I exploited people with my barreling frequencies, 3-bet and barrel off range simply had way too many bluffs, and I eventually adjusted it. And this is the, this is the lesson for today. Okay, the long win lesson with a lot of different stats. Um, but the lesson for today is, it's okay to play exploitative strategies if they win against the player pool you're in, or if they're good against a specific opponent. But don't think that you see a few hands and it means everything, because it doesn't. You need large data sets to be able to create good, accurate, uh, solid, exploitative play. That's why when you see one hand of one guy doing something and you base stuff off of that, I think it's rather foolish. Maybe the guy was having a bad moment. Maybe something happened you don't know about and he's just going crazy. You don't know those types of things. Also, the point has to be said that if you just play a good, solid strategy, you're going to win money. And there's some weird thing where people say, like, I don't know, what, it, what is it? What is it again they say? Fuck off. No, no, no. They said they said the, it's close, but it's the other thing. Fuck GTO. Yeah, you know, I just don't get it, man, because the thing is this. When you play a, a perfect strategy in a game, you're going to win, right? And in a game like poker, if you're playing a perfect strategy... Uh, even though there are strategies that could individually counter people harder, because you're getting to win so much with so much of your range, you're going to win a lot of money. And there's this weird misconception that exploitative players try to talk about, you know, theory strategies. Like, if you play a, a theory-based strategy, you're going to barely be winning. Like, you'll win, but barely. Like, nothing. Like, peanuts. Like, meanwhile, I'm, I'm crushing live poker. Like, I'm so fucking rich. Look how fucking rich I am. Look how rich and amazing I am at poker. It's because I looked at him and he blinked. No, like, it, it's silly. Like, sure, if you're good at that game, you'll win more money. I'm not going to tell you otherwise. The people that can exploit well will win more money. But the point is this. It's hard to teach. And also, the strategy that's just fundamentally sound will eventually win. So my point today is look at your games. Find exploits that work for them based on the data that you have available to them, to, available to you. But don't become the guy with 8-4 offsuit barreling it into a station that knows that you're bluffing too much.
Okay, maybe this was a bit of a dry video, but uh, if you guys enjoyed it, let me know. I'm happy to go through and get more of my hands. Maybe we could look at some fun ones that I played along the way, um, analyze some some data and some some stats from those matches. If you guys are into it, aren't into it, that's cool too. Either way, I enjoyed looking at uh, looking at these samples and talking about things. So anyway, guys, it's gonna be it for me. Thank you for joining. Hit the subscribe button, and I'll see you again tomorrow at 11 a.m. Probably. Been a little late lately, but fingers crossed.